Demon hunters, warring gods, and forgotten worlds await with TNM Comics. Click the links below to enter their fantastical realm. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and minor character who delivers an important announcement in the fifth act. Taking Shakespeare's plays and setting them in a different time and place is a common device, and it's easy to see why. On one claw, his work is timeless. Stories of love, vengeance, and the follies of human nature, written in magnificently vivid and poetic language. But on the other, the Elizabethan vocabulary and long speeches can feel intimidating, especially for those whose memories of Shakespeare comprise mainly of boring high school English classes. Setting a play in, say, the 1950s or during the Civil War provides additional context which can help audiences understand and relate to the characters and plot. Unfortunately, it also results in a lot of really really bad productions, including our next offender, Love's Labor's Lost. This movie comes to us via Kenneth Branagh, without a doubt the most famous Shakespeare interpreter working in film today, and followed his massively ambitious, four-hour-long, completely unabridged version of Hamlet. For Love's Labor's Lost, he went the opposite direction, making heavy cuts to the text and inserting songs from 1930s musicals in an attempt to make the material more approachable. Which, as it turns out, is a bit like Victor Frankenstein stitching a bunch of body parts together trying to make an attractive human being. So let's dissect Love's Labor's Lost and see where it lost the plot. The credits are done in a vintage, golden age of Hollywood style to set the tone. Ooh, awkward. And we settle in, expecting the unmistakable, lilting, musical rhythm of Shakespearean verse. September 1939. Ominous clouds of war may be gathering over Europe, but here in Navarre, the young king, seen here returning from military maneuvers, has announced an audacious plan for himself and his court. Or not. These newsreels pop up a lot throughout the movie to explain the plot and their sin number one. To begin with, it's a pretty clear indication that Brana doesn't trust the audience to be smart enough to follow along without a bit of hand-holding. Second, it makes the juxtaposition of the classical language with the more recent setting disjointed instead of smooth. Baz Luhrmann, of all people, managed this better by reworking the prologue of Romeo and Juliet as a series of media reports, making it feel urgent and modern. This is just odd and unnecessarily direct. The premise of the play is that the King of Navarre and his buddies have decided to devote themselves entirely to scholarly pursuits, taking a three-year vow of fasting and celibacy. Two of them, Longueville and Dumaine, sign on readily, but Barone is more reticent, possibly because he's played by Kenneth Branagh and, as the oldest and most well-spoken of the bunch, doesn't need an extra three years of college. What is the end of study? Let me know. Why, that to know, which else we should not know. Things hid and barred, you mean, from common sense. Aye, that is study's godlike recompense. But hey, why say it when you can sing it? Take a lesson from me. I'd rather Charles know. Think of what you might be. I'd rather Charles know. In this case, because singing it is going to be sin number two. If your song isn't going to forward the story, and let's be honest, most of the songs in the early movie musicals this one imitates didn't, then it needs to be able to stand up on its own merits of artistry, and the songs on display here don't. The cast sings well enough, even Matthew Lillard, which, given what we've heard of him previously, is a pleasant surprise, but the dancing is often amateurish and there's not enough energy to sustain the musical interludes. That the songs burst in out of nowhere and are dropped just as abruptly are testament to how unnecessary they are. It's like big-lipped alligator moments, the musical. Barone points out another snag in the king's plan to avoid the sight of women, in that the princess of France is due to make a state visit on behalf of her ailing father, and the king will have to receive her. So let that be a lesson, kids. Always check your calendar before putting a mass restraining order on the opposite sex. The princess, who just happens to have three attendants of her own in Rosaline, Catherine, and Mariah, is even now en route to Navarre via the fire swamp. Tell him the daughter of the King of France, on serious business, craving quick dispatch, 
importunes personal conference with his grace. Did Alicia Silverstone not have her lines quite memorized before they began filming? Sin number three on some inept Shakespeare delivery. The ladies in waiting, it so happens, are already crushing on the king's posse, which will make the inevitable pairing up that much easier. Unfortunately, the French embassy is ordered to camp outside the city limits and the king's no girls club radius, which seems a good way to start an international incident. Fair princess, welcome to the court of Navarre. Fair, I give you back again, and welcome I have not yet. I'll give you the non-iambic pentameter version here. The king tells the princess, your dad owes me money, and the princess is all, nuh-uh, we totally paid it back, Boyette, show him the receipt. And Boyette is all, um, the paperwork isn't here yet, should come by tomorrow. So the men go back to their books, and the women pitch their tents, but not before the awkward flirting leads to an awkward rendition of I Won't Dance. You know what? You're lovely. And so what? I'm lovely. But oh, what do you do to me? But what's a Shakespeare play without a motley assortment of comic supporting characters? Chief among them is Costard, the king's personal vaudevillian, who's been caught breaking the taboo on consorting with women with a saucy little minx named Jackanetta, and who gets ratted out by the ridiculously accented Don Armado. Um, the West corner of thy curious knotted garden. There did I see that low spirited a swine, that base minnow of thy mirth. Me? That unlettered, a small gnawing soul. Me? That shallow vassal. Still me? I get why Timothy Spall is doing this, but it does make the dialogue even harder to follow. Also, it feels like he's doing an extended version of his Italian waiter disguise from Enchanted. Don Armado's motives aren't entirely noble. He's rather taken with Jackanetta himself, which he demonstrates in Sin Number 4, I Get a Kick Out of You. I get no kick from champagne. Beer out the whole doesn't thrill me at all. So tell me why should it be true? That I get a kick out of you. Picture the Like a Virgin scene from Moulin Rouge with all the style and humor taken out of it, and you have this number. It's one of those scenes where random slapstick and silliness is mistaken for humor. I get a kick out of you. <laughs> oh, and a gay panic joke to wrap it all up nice. Meanwhile, back at the girls' camp... Oh, 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 woke up today... Hey, if we're going to throw in random music sequences, let's at least change it up a bit. As might be expected, the guys are head over heels for their female visitors and are mooning over them while ignoring reports of the imminent world war on their doorstep. Barone is the first to crack, giving Costard a love letter to pass on to Rosaline. Unfortunately, Costard already has been charged by Don Armado to deliver a similar note to Jackanetta, so the chances of the two missives getting mixed up are pretty much 100%. Barone's letter, incidentally, just happens to be the lyrics to The Way You Look Tonight. My eyes cannot roll far enough for this. And more awkward dancing abounds. Back at the actual plot, Holofrenia and Sir Nathaniel, two characters that the movie almost completely forgets about so I'm not even going to bother explaining who they are, deduce that Barone has written the letter Jackanetta has received and has broken his sacred no chicks oath. Meanwhile Barone, um never mind, we're looking at sheep for some reason. So anyway, Barone is going on about How glad the many millions of Annabelle's and Lillian's Or rather, the king is <laughs> Uh, Longaville is Oh, oh, sweet Lucifer, no, no! <laughs> Let's step away from that repulsive mental image to talk about sin number five, the movie's terribly short attention span. Trying to squeeze a five-act Shakespeare comedy into just under an hour and a half and throw a bunch of songs in at the same time means that a lot of stuff is going to get left on the cutting room floor. 
and this movie doesn't even try to make the edit flow smoothly. Scenes start and end abruptly, plot development is haphazard or forgotten entirely, and the subplot with the comic characters is so heavily cut that you wonder why they were left in the movie at all. The final result isn't going to do any favors to audience members who already think of Shakespeare as convoluted and confusing. Long story short, the guys all go into a You're behaving like a lovesick fool! No, you are! No, you! round table, interrupted by Barone, who declares love to be the only subject truly worth studying. Which, for some reason, goes into a fantasy sequence set to cheek to cheek. To heaven, I'm in heaven. This is the kind of musical where you spend time waiting for the musical numbers to be over, which is a pretty good indicator that it shouldn't be a musical in the first place. So the men decide, screw our oaths, let's pick up some babes! And they arrange a party for the ladies with the intention of showing up disguised to woo them. But the princess's loyal manservant, Boyette, gets word of the plot, and the princess decides two, or rather eight, can play at that game. So the women decide to disguise themselves and exchange tokens so the men will mistake them for each other. Even though they all have different hair colors and complexions and are color-coded right down to their cocktails. It's a Shakespearean comedy. This sort of thing happens a lot. This sort of thing, however, doesn't. It looks like Bob Fosse's Fifty Shades of Grey, and the atmosphere is supposed to be all smoky and mysterious, but it just looks like someone forgot to clean the camera lens. Sin number six for this particular dance number. Anyway, the joke is revealed, everyone has a good blank first laugh about it, and it's off to the next scene. rather, on to sin number seven, there's no business like show business. Most of the dancing in this film is subpar, Adrian Lester as Dumaine is a notable exception, but this is the sort of thing the people in Waiting for Guffman would be ashamed to stage. I know most of you aren't Tommy Toon, but dear Lord of Darkness, try harder. The song also replaces a performance staged by the lower class characters, similar to Pyramus and Thisbe in A Midsummer Night's Dream. While the original sequence is a bit long, in fact it's part of the longest scene in Shakespeare altogether, it would have had the advantage of bringing some closure to the otherwise neglected subplot, which ends with Castard accidentally revealing that Don Armado got Jackanetta pregnant. Nothing like good old-fashioned Shakespearean soap opera. But the buoyant mood is brought to a halt by ominous music announcing the arrival of Lord Killjoy here. The king... Your father. Dead. So yeah, we finally got a payoff to that offhand mentioned Chekhov's gun way back in Act 1. The princess, or queen now I guess, is understandably disraught and immediately wants to leave for home as Alicia Silverstone races through her big speech with no time to stop for direction. If over boldly we have borne ourselves in the converse of breath, your gentleness was guilty of it. An argument ensues where the princess chides the men for courting them in jest, and the king and baron respond with, Hey, we broke our oaths for you, don't we get a little something-something? The whole point is that everything has been light-hearted and fun until now, but the king is dead and war is imminent and there's no time for folly. This is where a stronger cast would have argued the main issue of the play much more convincingly, but here it's rushed and without much sense. The women propose a compromise. The men need to devote themselves to austerity and service for a year in order to prove their hasty oaths and give the ladies a decent period of mourning, at which point they can renew their suits if they so desire. The men agree, and we get one more 30 standard, and this one really tests Kenneth Branagh's vocal range. The song is ended, but as the songwriter wrote, the melody And so the women leave for France, sky-riding a farewell in the sky as they go, bringing the movie to a bittersweet but satisfying... End. 
Never mind, looks like we've got one more newsreel to sit through. This one messes up the tenor of the ending so much that it earns sin number eight, as we get a montage of the characters struggling through World War II that takes the conclusion from bittersweet to depressing. Who wants to see the players in this comedy dodging bullets and getting arrested by Nazis? How does it serve the movie to watch Boyette dying of a gunshot wound as he gets his mistresses to safety? And even though we do see things through to the war's ending, the final upswing at the end isn't enough to bolster our spirits after all the grief we just watched. The victory celebration and reunion feels melancholy, mostly because it's scored to a sad instrumental version of They Can't Take That Away From Me. Finally, it's just more dramatically effective to end the story on an ambiguous note, acknowledging the uncertainty and danger the characters face, rather than regarding their happy ending as inevitable, would allow us to empathize more with them, instead of slogging with them to a foregone conclusion. Part of watching Love's Labor's Lost is that I really would like to see this concept done well. I think you could mix together Shakespeare's dialogue and modern song and dance numbers and come up with something delightful and entertaining, especially if you used one of his more fantastical plays, like A Midsummer Night's Dream or The Tempest. But this movie ends up being an awkward mess, with a plot cut down to spark notes level and musical interludes that crop up suddenly, contribute nothing, and then go away without making much of an impression. It's an unsatisfying mishmash of elements, so the court of musical hell thinks it only fitting that those involved be punished by being forced to drink orange juice right after they brush their teeth. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. (laughs) 